Uh, hey, y'all, I think you can hear me. We'll get started at 1035. I just, um, you know, fiddling around with Zoom, trying to make sure I understand how all this stuff works. But yeah, just chill. You have another eight minutes before class starts. Hey y'all, how's it going? Like I said, we'll get going in about five minutes. I just wanted the room to be open for people to join as they come in. I'm also going to mute everybody so we can just like chit chat while we get started. Hello. What up? Are you playing Mario? Yep. My uh, neighbor. Huh? I've noticed the video on my phone is like normal, but when I put it on my computer, it's like really, really bad quality. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's because the webcam that I'm using is not the world's greatest webcam. It's pretty old. It's like more than 10 years old. Uh, oh. But when I was looking on YouTube, or sorry, Amazon at ordering a new one, um, surprise, surprise, Amazon is pretty backlogged with orders right now. So it'll probably be a while until I get a new one in. The that one Logitech one is really good. Mm. I mean, I would love it if you had one. It would make this video feed cooler, but I need to get my hands on one first. And yeah, this is the one I have for now. Um, hmm. Let me look at webcams. It's, I should probably at least just place the order so that it comes in quickly or as quick as possible. Um, yeah, no, all the webcams are sold out because now that everybody's working from home, everybody needs a new webcam. I should have ordered it a while ago. I, I didn't think about that. Yeah, no, like everything on Amazon having to do with working from home, exercising from home, all that stuff is straight sold out, man. Yeah, so the Logitech USB-C webcam, 60 frames per second, 1080p, $170 because it's sold out, but it's only being Jeez. sold by resellers. There was some guy that bought seven, no, like 20,000 bottles of hand sanitizer and tried selling 17. them all. No, no, he has 17,000 left. He tried like selling all of them for $70 mm -hmm. and now he, he has like 17,000 of them left and they took him off of Amazon because he was uh, pricing everything too high. Uh, yeah, because price gouging in an emergency is illegal and immoral. <laughs> um. Um. 
Uh, but yeah, did y'all get the tipper for the day? It's on Google Classroom. Yeah. Should we print that out? You don't have to print it out. You can do the work on a separate piece of paper and then just keep it together so that you can upload it as your classwork at the end of the week. Um, hi, welcome in everybody. Looks like we got 12, 13 people in here now, myself included. So we got 12 of y'all. Uh, how's it going? Great. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. Y'all can see me awkwardly in the heads up cam, right? Yeah. Yep. Yes. Cool. Cool. Like I said, we'll get going in about two minutes. Going to try and stick to normal class time as much as possible. I wish this was more comfortable. Like, it'd be tight if I could just stream Game Boy games to Twitch from my desk, but, like, this view sucks, or... Mr. Rob? Yeah? I think I'll be able to uh, grab that TV in the library at the end of the year? Uh, no. <laughs> Uh, I asked, asked Chin Chin Yan, he said, if it's possible, like, if I could, he'll let me get the TV and one of the iMacs. Uh, lit. I mean, yeah, that would be tight, but I'll tell you what, man, we have keys. Teachers got first dibs. Aw, oh, rip. Yeah. Um, hmm. I don't know if I would want anything from when the school shuts down other than the stuff in the lab, but that's dumb, right? To be like, oh, I have my own lab kit at home. Oh, yeah, one of those oscilloscopes would be nice. One of those oscilloscopes would be nice. That is true, actually. Yeah, that'd be nice for fixing my own junk. Uh, anyway, hey, uh, we're turning the corner on 1035, so let's go ahead and get started today. Um, welcome to Learning at Home, where Mr. Robinson uh, tries to keep this freight train going, even though it's already off the rails, you know? Um, for today's warm-up, I got uh, some announcements, and then I got two parts. So let's do the two parts of the warm-up uh, so that y'all can get going. Uh, part A, how's it going? And please do write a written response to this. Just tell me how things are going uh, in your situation of having to be hunkered down at home. We're going to make the most of it, but if um, there's any way in which I can like assist you in these trying times, uh, let me know. Um, just like reach out uh, if you need advice, support, material support that I can provide. Uh, just email me directly or send me a message through Classroom. Uh, on Google Classroom, you'll see that there's a tipper uh, there for us to do, page 229. Um, is some sort of uh, question involving a spring and a mask. Uh, so what's going on in that question, and, oops, sorry, let me grab my copy of the book. Uh, is that we have a card in a spring oscillating left and right, and notice that um, the graph that they're giving you there is a graph of various positions, so it should look like this, yeah? Um, and along the curve, we have several different points, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, uh, and down below, there are some questions that I would like y'all to answer uh, about those various points. Keep in mind that this initial graph is displacement, and they're using the exact same model we did, where in their solution for the differential equation that describes how an oscillator behaves, we choose cosine simply because for there to be oscillatory motion, you need an initial displacement. And as a result, cosine is a better choice than sine simply because cosine starts at one zero, an initial displacement, whereas sine starts at zero, zero. So go along and answer questions A through F to the best of your ability. And then we'll go over them. Uh, today we're gonna keep on going with notes. Today we're gonna talk about the small angle approximation, uh, which many consider to be a crime against mathematics, but you know, uh, that's fine. We'll talk about that when we get there. Uh, and we are going to use the small angle approximation in order to create models of, sorry, a model to describe pendulum. Um, past that, 
I'm gonna unmute everybody so that we could talk about the set of announcements I'm about to make, just some like general stuff. DJ um, so, oh, I shouldn't ah. have unmuted everybody. <laughs> um, okay, I'm gonna mute everybody and then if you wanna pipe in, you know, just unmute yourself. Uh, this is my AP group, so I expect y'all to be able to manage those unmute buttons just mm -hmm. fine. The other thing you can do is you can right click in there and you can click raise your hand. And if you uh, raise your hand, uh, I can call on you by clicking the raised hand and then it'll unmute your mic so you could talk. Uh, Y'all saw that I posted a three part announcement in Google Classroom over the weekend. I just wanna go over the three parts of that announcement real quick, just to make sure that we all know we're all on the same page. Um, item number one. Um, if you are like me and you collect video game thingums, so like not just old stuff like this, but specifically those of you out there with uh, gaming PCs, um, you too can actually help with uh, research in terms of finding a cure or a treatment or ideally a vaccine for the virus, which is the cause for why we're doing this learn from home thing anyway, uh, through an awesome piece of software called Folding at Home. Uh, people are always like, hey, this supercomputer is millions of times stronger than our normal computers, right? Uh, but that is a two-sided coin. Sure, a supercomputer in the basement of a college might be as powerful as a few million computers, but that means that if we make a million of our own home computers work together, a million of our own home computers working together must also have the same power as a supercomputer. So I posted the link to Google Classroom already, but when you have folding at home, so here's me running my, oh, I love this effect too. <laughs> Anyway, when you have folding at home, uh, this is my laptop. It's not really strong enough to help folding at home, but here's my desktop. And you know, I got my Cuphead stickers or whatever. Inside of my desktop, I have a 1080 Ti. And so I'm running folding at home, which is using my processor and my video card in order to run simulations. And what it's running simulations of are protein folding math problems. This is the protein it's folding. Oh yeah, I also am a nerd. I got that dual monitor set up. This is the protein it's folding over here. And if we can figure out the correct pattern of how to fold the vaccine for this particular virus, then it will help the actual researchers. Like it tells you while it's folding down here, what research you are currently helping with. And when it's done, it'll send the data back to the researchers so that they can aggregate it. Uh, you can set how much power it uses because the more it's using, the more electricity it'll pull. But it doesn't actually use that much bandwidth, which is why I'm having it run, even though I'm doing my stream right now. So if I switch this to full, it'll just, you know, increase the power to the CPU and the video card and do the calculation even faster. Uh, are there any questions on folding at home? No. But yeah, I mean, even though, you know, for the most part, um, this is out of our hands, there are things that we can do to help, you know, every little bit counts. Uh, also, just to try and keep morale up and make sure that we all, you know, stay mentally busy, um, I'm going to reactivate 8-Bit Club. So if you want to rejoin 8-Bit Club and play video games on Friday afternoons, oh, hey, my cat. <gasps> Let's see. It's <clears throat> Professor Cat. It's a game. Hi. Hey. <laughs> it's so cute. Yeah, I'm sure they'll be bopping in because if I uh, don't leave the door open to the office, uh, they'll scream outside and cause an even bigger distraction. But hey, anyway, um, 8 Bit Club, if you add this code to your Google Classroom, it'll add it as a class 3QPTDNV. And we're going to use that to organize video games on Friday afternoons the way that 8 Bit Club used to be. Since we're all bored and slowly losing our minds without uh, stuff to do, um, I just want to make sure that we have a place to meet to talk about video games, organize sessions. I'm also going to reactivate the 8-Bit Club Twitch channel so that we can stream that stuff out. And we'll probably have a Discord so that we can talk trash. Um, uh, the nice thing is that new Call of Duty Battle Royale is free, so you know we could always do that. Uh, any questions on that? I've been playing the Battle Royale for four days straight. Uh, tight, same. Uh, me and my, my boys, we came in third yesterday. We felt very accomplished considering we're uh, old men as far as these shooters are concerned. I got to level 82 in two days. That's powerful. 
Um, in terms of other stuff to do while you're at home, um, y'all saw that I posted in that three-part update that uh, the yoga app Down Dog is free until the end of the month. Um, just so y'all know, Down Dog is a yoga, nope, not Pokemon Home, not Pokemon Home. Uh, Down Dog is a yoga app and um, it's pretty good. It, it lets you make a playlist. You can set the difficulty, the length, uh, all of that stuff, but normally it's really limited in terms of what you can do. It's free for everybody until the end of the month because they know that people are stuck at home and yoga studios are closed. You don't need a yoga mat to do yoga. You can just do it on the floor on a carpet or a towel or whatever. It's a good way to make sure that like your muscles don't atrophy since you're not leaving the house. Um, and on top of that, they said that um, students and school accounts would be free all the way until July for anybody with a .edu email. Our school doesn't use .edu emails, so I sent an email directly to their company to add them to the whitelist. So if you make your account with your school email, right, um, it should be free until July. And, uh, yo, it's, it's a lot of money saved. It's either 10 or 15 bucks a month, I forget, but it's, it's a really high quality um, service. Uh, the other things that y'all can do to, like, keep your bodies active as well as your minds is Nike has two apps, Nike Run Club, which is straightforward. It just monitors your runs. I'm still going out on runs, but, you know, when I go out there, I keep a two-meter radius around myself in which I don't like let people enter. Um, and then the other thing that you can do is Nike Training Club, NTC, also highly recommended. And if you wanna like add me as a friend or whatever, it does this awesome thing where it's like, your friend, Mr. Robinson is exercising, cheer him on. And if you tap cheer him on, it'll give me like confetti and it'll be like, hey, your friends are cheering on your workout and I'll do the same or whatever. Uh, Nike Training Club is basically make your own CrossFit. So you tell it like, hey, I want a playlist that works out these muscle groups or whatever. And uh, whether or not you have equipment, it has a, a no equipment mode, a basic equipment mode in case you happen to have some dumbbells or maybe resistant bands, you know, the regular workout gear at home. And then if you happen to have a full gym at home, it also has workout options that use all of the equipment. So no matter what stuff you do or don't have at home, there are at least two different workout apps that you can get and use uh, in these times. Uh, is that stuff okay? Are there any questions up through there? No. Okay. And then the last thing that I'll recommend is a final app called Office Lens, which is a Microsoft product. Icon looks like this. It looks like a Microsoft Office product because it is, but this one's weird. With Office Lens, what it does is it lets you take a picture. So like, let's say I'm taking a picture of these notes. But after it takes the picture, it auto photoshops it. So it turns the background bright white, it turns the text perfectly black, and it crops it rectangularly so that it's easy to export as a PDF. If you find yourself taking pictures of documents to turn into teachers, it's a lot easier to use than a regular scanner, and it produces basically the same quality output file. Um, I highly recommend it. It'll make it easier to read the stuff that I'm going to be asking y'all to turn in. Um, so I think that's it in terms of general announcements. So let's talk about where we're headed with the class for the next few weeks while we're all stuck at home. Um, I brought home everything I needed for us to keep the class going. So to talk about springs and spring masses, I got my spring. Oh, God. <laughs> Tight glass table, not shattered. To talk about springs and spring masses, I got my uh, oscillators, brought them home. Um, to talk about pendulums, I brought my pendulums home. Uh, and with all the other stuff that we need to talk about and do, I also brought home that equipment. So uh, we're going to run lecture out through the end of this chapter. All we have left to talk about are how pendulums work, and then what is a damping factor. And then we're going to have a two or three day virtual lab next week where I'm gonna do the entire lab um, through Zoom. Uh, I'm gonna take this document camera and I'm gonna point it at the apparatus as we go through it. And since I brought home the Vernier tablets, I'm gonna be taking the set of data with the Vernier tablet. I'm gonna take that, I'm gonna export it as an Excel spreadsheet so that everybody at home has the data. And it will have a pre-lab and a post-lab that will be all online that you'll be able to answer there. Uh, we'll do the data analysis together and we'll also get a chance to learn some new skills um, 
in Desmos and in Excel. Uh, and you will upload that lab to Google Classroom like normal. And then afterwards, you'll attach it to your um, laboratory notebook and add it to the table of contents with all the other labs. Uh, Y'all will also notice that I asked you to upload a scan of the last lab we did, the one where we did all the hands-on activities involving oscillators before we started. So if you um, haven't done that already, please take the time to scan it nicely and upload it for me, because that'll be your first big grade of this quarter. Is all that stuff okay? Is that cool? Yep. Yep. Cool. When was the oscillators worksheet due? Um, it was actually due like last Monday, but I told y'all I just I was gonna hold off grading it until this quarter so that we would start the quarter off with a full credit grade mm -hmm. um, in the lab section. So if you haven't already, just there's a spot for it in Google Classroom now. Upload it there. Uh, here's the other hilarious thing. Uh, Y'all will notice that I posted a YouTube link to the Google Classroom. Uh, I took the time while I was prepping to get all this stuff set up, and I made a YouTube channel called Mr. Robinson's Classroom, which I'll get the URL for it after I get to enough subscribers or whatever. But please click that link, um, like and subscribe, uh, just because I'm going to be posting all of these lectures there. So if you ever show up late, or if you miss something, or if you want to go over something again, um, the links will be, I'm sorry, these videos will be archived and then uploaded to YouTube to commemorate our time doing online learning together. Uh, I'm also going to be separating them by channel. So it'll be a separate channel within, in there just for AP Physics. So it's easy to sort the videos by date. Uh, and I'm also going to make an 8-Bit Club channel to upload any like good replays that we might happen to capture on a Friday afternoon. Uh, so please check that out. Uh, nonetheless, let's go ahead and get started with the tipper. Um, and this is just like open discussion. So, um, you know, if you want to comment, just unmute your mic, chime in. Uh, let's start with item number one. At which point or points is the acceleration positive? Is it EF? Um, at which point or points is the acceleration positive? So uh, it's definitely E. And it's definitely F. And uh, there's actually one more piece to this answer. Is it D? H? Uh, at H, the acceleration would be negative. Oh. D? Hmm? D? D is the other answer, yeah. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit about why. Why is it these three points and no other points? Well, you got to keep in mind that even though we're talking about oscillators, which themselves may be very fancy, all of the normal physics that we've talked about up to this point still applies. So all that this is actually asking about is Hooke's law. F is equal to negative kx. So the points at which the acceleration would be positive are simply the points at which the displacement would be negative. Points D and E and F along this curve are all places where the cart has been displaced in the negative direction. So therefore, the spring is trying to push it back. Is that first part okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and by the way, when we're done with this, I'm going to show you all some other stuff I can do in Zoom. Uh, we'll be talking about all of these graphically in a moment. So if that first bit of the explanation didn't make sense, get the answers down now, and then we'll go over it in Desmos. Um, item B. At which point or points does the cart have zero velocity? The other part of that sentence is irrelevant, but at which two points does this object have zero velocity? Um, is it A and E? Is it A, yeah. A or E? A and E. Oh, A and E. So keep in mind that when it comes to our oscillator, right, at point A, it's saying that our displacement will be all the way up, so it's changing direction. At point E, it's all the way down, so again, it'll be changing direction. Whenever an object is changing direction, the velocity must be zero, because if you're going from positive to negative or negative to positive, the intermediate value theorem says that you have to cross through zero. So at maximum displacement, at minimum displacement, we're turning around. Wherever you turn around, you have to have a temporary velocity of zero. Very good. Um, where, at which point or points is the net force on the cart equal to zero? G and C. It's Excellent. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> yep. When it crosses through that axis, it's equal to zero. 
That's because the card is passing through its equilibrium position. It's coming back through that center spot. And when it's there, the spring's not doing anything. So the picture that we should have in our head is we pull it back, it overshoots the middle, but as it passes through the middle, the net force is zero. It shoots over because it has some momentum, and then the spring stops it, turns it around, sends it back, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Uh, D. At which point or points, sorry, at which point or points are the acceleration, velocity, and displacement all positive? Is it H? They're not all positive. H is an interesting choice. So H would be correct, except at H, the position is positive, the velocity is positive, but the acceleration is negative. We have a hard and fast rule that says that if the acceleration that says if the acceleration uh, is one sign, the position is the other sign. This is a trick question. Oh. It kind of is. It kind of is, right? Uh, but there is still an answer simply because we consider zero to be... I don't want to get... I swear I'm going to upload this to YouTube and then I'm going to get some math nerd in the comments who's like, actually, zero is... If you say that zero is positive, which we're going to do for the sake of convenience, then consider the two points, C and G, right? So in both C and G, the position is zero and the acceleration is zero. But one of these points, and this is going to be a calculus kid answer, at one of these points, the velocity is positive. Which one and how do you know? G, is it G? Why is it G, Alex? That's an interesting answer. And hey, y'all, don't draw on the over screen. I can see the smiley face in the bottom left. <laughs> I mean, that's a tight tool to use if you have a question, but um, whoever drew the happy face, thank you. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's G. Why is it G? Because, like, the slope, like, around G is, like, positive. Exactly. The local slope is positive, which means at that point the velocity is positive. So at G, the position is zero, the acceleration is zero, but the velocity is some positive value. The only answer that suits is G. Uh, Question E, at which point or points is the acceleration non-zero and opposite in sign to the position? Is it F? Is it? Or uh, F is part of the answer. Okay. Is it everything except C and G? That is correct. It is everything except C and G. So let's okay. go ahead and read the question one more time. At which point or points is the acceleration non-zero and opposite in sign to the position? So that condition, opposite in sign to the position, that's true everywhere. F is equal to negative kx, right? Hooke's law. So force and position always point opposite directions. Uh, so we really just need to know where is it non-zero? It is non-zero everywhere except C and G. So the answer, F is part of it. I'll rewrite that. But the answer from left to right is A, B, D, E, F, H. That is a true statement of all of those positions. And then the final question, at which point or points is the velocity non-zero and opposite in sign to the acceleration? Is this on H? Um, let's see. So this is a much harder question mentally. This is going to require some mental gymnastics. So keep in mind that the acceleration is the opposite of the position. So at A, is the position positive or negative? Um, positive. So the force would have to be? Negative. Good, right. So at A, the position is positive. The acceleration would have to be negative. That's how we're figuring out what acceleration is. But then the velocity is just going to be the slope. So at A, the slope is zero because we're at the top of the hill. And so zero slope means zero velocity, but the acceleration is negative. We're going to do that same sort of comparison to all of these points. But like I said, it's a lot of mental gymnastics. Um, so at position B, is the velocity, is the slope positive or negative? Negative. Negative, negative slope, right? And the acceleration here has to be negative because the position is positive. So at B, velocity is negative, acceleration is negative. That doesn't fit. Uh, what about at C? What's the acceleration? 
for zero. Zero. Zero, which we'll consider as being positive. And at that point, the velocity is negative because it's decreasing from left to right. The slope is negative. So we could throw C on this list. That point works. Uh, D, the slope is negative. The force is positive. That works. E, no. the force is, sorry, the acceleration is negative, but the velocity is? Positive. The velocity is actually zero in this case, because if you're at a, like the top of a hill or the bottom of a valley, we consider those slopes to be zero. So here at E, velocity is zero, which we'll call positive, and the acceleration is negative, so this also fits the condition. At F, the velocity is? Positive. Positive, because we're back on that upward slope. Velocity is positive, acceleration is also positive. The displacement is negative, so the acceleration must be positive. For F, the acceleration and the velocity are both positive. That doesn't meet the condition. G, acceleration is? Zero. Very okay. good. And the velocity is positive. Zero, we'll consider that to be positive. So they're the same sign here. And then for H, we can say uh, yep. something similar. Slope is positive, but the acceleration is? Negative. Negative. So that is opposite. That also meets our condition. That is a much trickier question. Okay. Are there any other questions about today's warm up? No? No. Okay, great. Uh, and like I said, keep your warm ups for the week. Uh, you'll be uploading them this week on Thursday because there's no class on Friday for a teacher's meeting. Uh, you'll be uploading all the warm ups for the week there where I'll give grades and feedback. Um, up next, uh, the last thing we did before we went um, to break was we talked about a bunch of very, very, very complicated equations that describe the motion of a pendulum. So what I'm gonna do right now is I'm going to change my screen cap over to um, Desmos, which should take over right now. Okay, are y'all now in Desmos? Yes. And you can see me move it around live? Yep. Yep. Uh, can you see my mouse cursor? Yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, so this first thing that I'm showing y'all, and I will share this Desmo page to everybody when I'm done so that you can use it in the homework, uh, is I have created all of the equations, the equations that solve the differential equation that describe an oscillator. Um, I built all of them out for you. So this first one here is the position, which is exactly the same as the position graph that we saw in the warm up, right? But to do all the other stuff, to talk about the acceleration, the velocity, we were basically doing mental gymnastics. Instead, I built them all out for you here on the left. So this first one is the position. What's the second one? What's this equation here? Velocity. That's velocity. And for those of you in calculus, you know, uh, you should be able to do that. Take this function, take its derivative, you get this next function. If you're not in calculus, that's fine. Uh, just be sure to like have these written out so that you can use them later. And so instead of like doing the mental gymnastics, we can match up the values. So we know that like, oh, hey, look, right here, when the position is at maximum, what's the velocity? Zero. Zero. And here, when it's at its equilibrium position, notice the velocity is at its negative maximum. So this shows how these two values, red being position and blue being velocity, these two change over time together. Is this okay? Yeah. Okay. This next one, what's this function? We take this guy, we take velocity's derivative. What is the derivative of velocity? Acceleration. Perfect, this is acceleration. Or if we multiply it by mass, it would give us force. So this orange graph could be either the acceleration or the force. The two have the exact same transforms over time. And again, look, it's just the same thing as position, but negative. So when position is at its positive maximum, force is at its negative maximum. When force is at its positive maximum, position is at its negative maximum. And what are these weird ones down here? What is sine squared? What is cosine squared? Kinetic energy. So sine squared is kinetic energy because it's one half velocity squared. That's where the two comes from. And then what about cosine squared? Potential energy. That is the potential energy. So I'm going to close off these first three graphs. 
and I'm going to activate these two, notice that both of these are always positive, the way that energy should be. And if you add up the two of them at any given point, they're going to add up to the total amount of energy because energy is conserved. So when all of the energy is connect, I'm sorry, when all of the energy is potential, zero of it is kinetic, right? When all of the energy is kinetic, none of it is potential. And when it's half kinetic, it's half potential. But at every single point, these two add up to the total. You have potential and kinetic being traded off back, forth, back, forth, back, forth, back, forth, back, forth, as the little spring mass oscillates. And here's the other thing I like about this page. Doot, doot, doot. You could put all of them on top of each other and look at all of this crazy motion that I'm asking y'all to learn. This is just to justify, no, this isn't easy, right? And we learned from the lab to have certain expectations of how this guy's gonna behave over time. How does this guy behave? What happens if I switch it for a stiffer spring? Faster. It it's goes faster, faster right? And so of the values here, which one of them is the stiffness of the spring? Um, the kinetic energy? The um, sine squared one? Uh, that's kinetic energy, but I'm saying of these oh, yeah. uh, variables, A, K, and oh. M, which one of those talks about how stiff the spring is? Isn't it K? It is K. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So once I, again, I'm going to send this uh, graph to everybody. If you make K bigger, if you make the spring stiffer, Ooh. all of the relative properties of this motion stays the same, except notice it gets packed into a smaller space in terms of time. When you have more waves in the same given space, that's the same as just saying faster. And if we make the spring looser, all of it spreads out, which is to say slower. Is that okay? And also oddly satisfying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And what about the mass? What do we expect to happen as the mass goes up or down? Get slower. It should get slower. So notice here, if I increase the mass, it makes the motion slower. If I decrease the mass, it makes the motion faster by a lot. Mr. Robinson? Yeah. Um, is the, for the potential and kinetic energy equations, is the A like not supposed to be squared? Oh, good catch. That is supposed to be squared. Yep. Does that make a difference? Uh, it does in terms of units. Without that information, um, the kinetic energy and potential energy equations would have the wrong units. But in terms of their motion, no, it doesn't change anything. Um, okay. But it does make them have the correct units, which in physics, you know, that's king, right? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. And actually, that brings me to my final point on this Desmos graph before I whoop, hit save and then send a copy of this out to everybody. Uh, notice, changing the amplitude, what exactly does that change physically? Height. It changes how far it bounces back and forth, but does it change anything else? No, no. Uh, momentum. So you are correct. It will change the maximum velocity. It will therefore change the total amount of energy. And that makes good sense because the further you stretch a spring, the more energy you're packing into it according to one half kx squared, right? Um, however, while it affects the energy and it affects the momentum, it does not affect the timing whatsoever. So check this out. If I increase A, it'll make everything taller, but is the width changing? No. 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 Because of the way that A is positioned in these equations, it doesn't matter how far you displace it. It's not going to move faster or slower. The timing will be the same. The only difference is that it'll be a more energetic thing to observe, a more energetic action. So keep in mind in this sheet, if you're ever going to use this to help yourself, think about these problems. They can be toggled on and off by clicking here on the left side. And on top of that, the order in which these are laid out is the order in which we derived them. Function one is position. Function two is velocity. Function three is acceleration. Function four is kinetic energy. Uh, function five is potential energy. And all of them are tied to the same sliders. So if you adjust the amplitude A, the spring constant K, and the mass M, you can see what that does to the motion. I'm going to post this to Google Classroom now. It'll be useful both for your homework and for the take-home lab that we do next week.
Is that okay? Yep. Yeah. Cool. Uh, and let's go ahead and go back to the document cam. And we'll talk a little bit about Pendula today and we'll commit, uh, you know, crimes against mathematics. Uh, so. Um, Mr. Robinson. Yes. If we have a missing homework, can we still turn it in? Yes, please. Yeah. And actually, because of these emergency conditions that we're now all living under, um, I believe the counseling department was kind enough to hold the grade books open all the way to Friday. Oh. So as long as you get it into me before the grade books are closed, it will be considered for your quarter three grade. Okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, is that okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. So now let's commit crimes against mathematics simply so that we can figure out what the equations are for a pendulum. And again, for a pendulum, we already have an expectation of what the answer is because of that lab that we did. When it came to the mini lab activity that we did, right, that pendulum, um, did, the, did the mass matter? No. No, we were able to show that if you make two pendulums that have the same length but different masses, uh, for whatever reason, when the universe does its math, it doesn't care what the mass is. This is only dependent on what? Length. The length, which, uh, check this out, and I got an extension cable just so that I could back up from my camera. So here I have my pendulum, real short, right? What do you notice about the motion? It's pretty fast. Relatively fast compared to what we've observed. And now as I lengthen it, the longer it gets, the more time it takes to complete one full cycle. Yeah? Yeah. Yep. And then back to short, and it goes fast again. So what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to write out some kind of equation or something which encapsulates this. And we know that we will do a good job because increasing L will make things slower and changing M shouldn't do anything. And so, like all other systems which are driven by a force, guess what kind of diagram we're gonna start off this section on pendulums with? A free body diagram. A thousand years free body diagram because what Newton said was that if you can tell me the forces, I can feed those forces to Newton's laws and Newton's laws will be able to predict the motion for the rest of forever. So today we're going to pick up the notes right where we left off, even though we're all like at home in our bedrooms and sweatpants probably, uh, with notes on pendula. And, uh, you know, pendula is one of those nightmare words that when we pluralize it, because English is so prone to borrowing words from other languages, it has its own special pluralization word. So instead of calling them pendulums, if you're cool, you call multiple pendulum pendula. Uh, nonetheless, I'm going to go ahead and start off by drawing my pendulum. And so, here it is in its central position. And when it comes to these central positions, what do we call that? Equilibrium. Our middle position is called oh. our equilibrium position. Equilibrium. And I only, you know, drill this vocab because y'all are going to need it for the AP test. Oh, which, by the way, quick note on the college board. Uh, I guess, have y'all heard yet about the SAT? It doesn't matter because no. it's too late it for y'all's SATs anyways, but the SAT is canceled for the month. Uh, no word has come down yet on what they're going to be doing for AP tests. They haven't been postponed or canceled yet, but there may be modifications, either a delay or they'll be online or something. All of that is still in the wind, it's all rumors, but as soon as I have um, better data, I'll let you know. Okay. All right. Nonetheless, we're gonna assign some properties to this pendulum. So this pendulum has a length of L, and this pendulum has a mass of M at the bottom, though we know that in the end, if we do this right, that thing should cancel out. And just to make sure that the pendulum is to scale, I'm gonna go ahead and use this compass. So it's gonna swing through this arc. Yeah, and so we have two positions that it's going to reach. This guy right here, this guy right here, and I'm gonna say on each side that this is an angle theta. Is that okay? Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So let's go ahead and for these two positions, let's go ahead and label the forces on there so that we can figure out why this moves the way that it does, what exactly is driving it. So what is the force that we have along a string? Tension. That is tension. And notice that these tensions, tension one, tension two, tension three, they're all actually different. Why? Why do they all have to be different? Because the string is moving? Different location. That is correct, because the string is moving. And if the tension always points along the string, when it's over here, it'll point that way. When it's in the middle, it'll point straight up. And when it's out to the other side, it'll point this way. So since forces are vectors, if the direction is changing, we say that that term is changing. So tension in this case is not a constant, it's a function. And actually, if you think about it, when we did the lab, what kind of sensor were we using to measure the pendulum part? Was it a force sensor? Force sensor. It was a force sensor, yeah. It was this guy right here, right? And what this is sensing is the tension itself, is what's pulling down on that hook. So literally, that graph that you were reading, it wasn't the X graph, it wasn't the V graph, you weren't measuring the position and velocity. The whole time you were actually looking at the acceleration graph. Good? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so, let's go ahead and draw the free body diagram for all three of these positions. Uh, and let's do the easy one first. What is it in the middle? What does this have to be? It's MG. Zero? I mean, uh, sorry, yeah, MG. <laughs> I mean, yeah, no, but it adds to zero. So we have MG down. And we have T2 up. T2 and Mg must be equal and opposite because when our pendulum is in that centered position, it's not destroying the string and or the string and falling, and it's not flying into the sky, which means the sum of the forces must be zero. But what about these two more interesting positions? Guess what we're gonna do here? Mm -hmm. The same thing. We're going to need trig. Yeah. Oh. And here's the trig that we're going to do, though I think we can appreciate that this answer and this answer will be the same thing, right? Just mirror images of each other. Mm -hmm. And so right here, we'll draw the free body diagram. Uh, I guess gravity still exists, right? Yes. So here at this other position, it has to have an mg. And what other force has to be here? Tension. Oh, tension's already there. And the tension, but it's going to be in the direction of the string. Now, just like with ramps, right? When it comes to doing ramp math, I got a block on a ramp. Here's my ramp. And gravity points this way. So instead of just letting gravity point down away from the ramp, what do we do to that downwards vector mathematically? Mg sine theta. We decompose it with trig. We get a sine part, which is in the direction of the ramp, so that we could talk about the motion that way. And what's the other component that we get? Cosine. Mg cosine theta, which is MG. into the ramp. And when we talk about ramps, this part here is defining our normal force, which we can do all sorts of cool stuff with, like use it to talk about friction. So we're going to do the same thing here. We're going to say that T3, that's acting in the way that I like. That is something that we can work with. And so I'm going to decompose mg into two vectors. Oh, hey, this pen is brand new. I'm not going to use that yet. And so we're going to decompose mg into two parts. We're going to have the piece of mg that's this way. And we're going to have the piece of mg that is this way. Now, if you think way back to similar triangles, which I'm not going to ask y'all to do. Y'all were like good at that when you were freshmen or sophomores or whatever. But this angle, by the laws of parallel lines, must be the same as this little internal angle here, simply because gravity is parallel to the position of the pendulum when it's in its central position. So if you want to get crazy with the geometry marks, I could say that this is parallel to this. So therefore, this and that are corresponding angles, right? And by the rules of trig, at this position over here, what is this component? Is that adjacent or opposite of my angle? Uh, adjacent. 
Adjacent. That's adjacent. So therefore, which trig function is it? So co cosine. That's cosine. And it means the one pushing us back to the middle is? Sine. Sine. We got it. That right there is our restorative force. So let me go ahead and draw this free body diagram out here a little bit bigger so that we can get a better grasp on it. However, we just figured out that our restorative force is based on the cosine of the angle. So this is to say that for a blown up version of the same free body diagram, I have mg. I have part of it, which points back to the middle, that's mg sine theta. And I have the part of it, which is perpendicular, that's mg cosine theta. These are not three separate forces. These are all the same thing. This is supposed to be built out such that if you take mg sine theta and mg cosine theta and add them together, then in its grand total, it adds up to mg. And then what's the other force that is acting on here other than just the weight? The tension. The tension. Yeah. The tension. And what does tension have to be equal to based on this free body diagram? Mg. The mg. Tension three is equal to mg cosine theta. These guys are equal and opposite. So mg sine theta is our culprit. What's it called when we have a force that pushes us back to the middle? Restorative force. Straight up. That is our re... Uh, oh, no. I made a mistake, and that mistake will live forever on YouTube. <laughs> I have my restorative force, mg sine theta, and that guy is going to push us back to the middle. What time is this class over? 35, I think. Perfect, I think, yeah. No, I think 31. 31. Yeah, 31. That, yeah, that's good. That's good. I need about another 10 minutes it's right on time. So uh, whenever Mr. you see Rob, a pendulum, yes. Um, for, let's say for T1, would it be the same thing as that, except it would be sine and then the restorative force would be cosine? No, that's a good question. Even over here, it's going to be mg sine theta, but pointed this way. Even for the restorative force? Even the restorative force on both sides is mg sine theta, but it will automatically change direction based on the angle. So okay. uh, positive angle will give you back a positive sign. Negative angle will give you back a negative sign. Okay. So here's what's happening. I pull it sideways, and because I've lifted it up, I've given it a little bit of gravitational potential energy, and as it falls, gravity is pulling it back down according to mg sine theta. The bigger the angle, the bigger I pull it back down. And so, before the problem that we were solving, when it, we did all of this beautiful math and we solved differentials, and we were like, well, for our spring mass, oh, and by the way, if I didn't already say it at the top, I'm taking all these notes down on paper, so if you ever miss a set of notes, uh, simply email me what date it was that you were missing, and I'll uh, scan and upload them to you. It's tedious to scan every day's notes, so I won't just do it automatically. But if you're ever missing a day, just send me, a, like, tell me what day, and they're all yours. But when it came to solving a spring mass system, we said, okay, I have a restorative force. F is equal to negative kx. What's Newton's second law? F is equal to m. That's what's up. MA is equal to negative KX. We've learned that acceleration and position are inherently related to each other by calculus. This is to say M is equal to D squared X DT squared. And actually, in case I get some physics nerds showing up in my comment section, these are both partial derivatives. Please don't kill me. And this is equal to negative KX. And if you go through the Ansatz technique, and you learn how to solve differential equations, we can show that the best answer to this is actually cosine. Cosine is its own second derivative. So similarly, uh, we would want to do the exact same thing with a pendulum. So uh, we'll do the same process. I have its restorative force. What is its restorative force, we just said? Mg sine theta. F is equal to mg sine theta. What's uh, Newton's second law? F equals m.
And here's revelation number one. Wow. What cancels on both sides? And, um, yep. Wow. That's big. <laughs> so, yeah, isn't that satisfying? <laughs> so whenever it comes to things which are driven inherently by gravity, you almost always get to a point where you're like, oh, there's an M on each side. They cancel out. It's not just algebra. There is meaning there. It means that the mass doesn't affect the motion, which we all saw in the lab, right? Yeah. And here's the second part. Uh, A is based on position. So it's partial derivative, second derivative of x, dt squared, is equal to g sine theta. And uh, here's what's up. You solve that differential, um, which is rough, because this differential is built around the fact that theta is somehow based on x and the length. Uh, it's rough, right? It's rough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. While this differential is solvable, it's definitely not going to be asked of somebody taking uh, AP physics. Um, though, for further information on this topic, here's the graduate level version of the textbook for this class. This is the classical dynamics of particles and systems by Thornton and Marion. Um, and if you want to get into what solves this particular system, if you were going to do it with math the full blown way, you need two pieces of the solution and they're coupled to each other. However, we're not going to do this. Instead of taking the physicist hardcore approach, we are going to take the engineer's approach, which no hate to engineers, they make the world go round, but that's where this originates. Let's go ahead and commit a crime against mathematics. We're going to do a very clever thing called the small angle approximation. And after we talk about the small angle approximation, we'll probably stop here for today and pick up tomorrow, and then we'll have the equations that solve our pendulum. So I'm going to change the screen cap over one more time. Dee, 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 dee. Nope. Nope, not that one. I want this one. Do you guys see it? No. Mm -hmm. no. How about now? Yes. yes. Okay. So here is the small angle approximation in a nutshell. Though please don't tell a mathematician I did this, otherwise we'd have to like box. Um, <laughs> Which don't get me wrong, I'll fight a math major, but you know they might have the virus, and I'm not trying to get hands on me. Uh, nonetheless, nonetheless, if you are doing something with sine, but the calculus would be a nightmare, instead of using sine, we can do something else. Notice, what are these two uh, functions I tossed in here? What's the red one? Sine x. Yeah, it's a sine wave, perfect red sine wave. And what's the uh, blue function? Just Y equals X. Yeah. A line of slope one and intercept zero, just regular old Y equals X. Now, do these two functions look the same? No. Nope. nope, but let's zoom in. Do they look the same now? They're getting there. They look similar. They Almost. look similar. Now let me keep zooming in. Yep. Oh, they're the same now. <laughs> they are the same, yeah. If you look at them in the very, very, very narrow case between uh, 0.1 and 0.1, if you keep your view in here, there's really not that much difference between sine and just y equals x, unless you start getting out here where you can see that they diverge, and they diverge more the more you head out, right? Yes. Is that okay? Yeah. This is why when we did the lab, I told y'all, hey, don't take the pendulum. Don't pull it back to a really big angle. Because if you take a pendulum and you pull it back to a really big angle, it won't behave in the way that AP physics says it will. However, the smaller your angle, as long as you only displace it a little bit, this will behave perfectly according to our equations of motion. And this is all made possible by the small angle approximation. Is this okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and this will be the final item for today, simply because I don't, I don't want a bunch of math nerds showing up in my comment section, man. I don't want them there being like, but actually when you take the second derivative, there's a big difference. Yeah, okay, all right. 
Sure. <laughs> this is AP Physics 1. Let's all calm down. Here's the deal with the small angle approximation. For small angles, we can say that sine of x is basically equal to x. And this only works for small angles. And here's like more or less the scope in which you want to keep it. As long as you are within the following bounds, uh, theta uh, much, much less than 30 degrees, which is pi over 6 radians, as long as you're in that range, it'll never be off by more than about 8%. Being within plus or minus 30 degrees only gives you about an 8% error in terms of the real value, and it makes the math way easier. And again, this works, and you should sketch this out for yourself, because, yo, if I graph sine, we're going to get a wave function. If I graph y equals x, we get a straight line. But if I zoom way in here on the origin, right here in the middle, they're indistinguishable. Here's what sine looks like in that gap. Here's what x looks like in that gap. Inside of this very tiny range, they're the same. So instead of solving this nightmare where sine of theta is actually a function of x, and so you could solve this differential, but you know, you'd have to go ask for some help from somebody from a math department. Instead, we can say, hey, this is good enough to describe our pendulum. This is going to be equal to g times what? Sine theta. We're going to approximate sine theta, and instead we're going to say sine theta is basically just x. X. Or theta? Theta. 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 And tomorrow we're going to pick up, and we're going to see how this can give us back our equations of motion. And just like before in Desmos, uh, I'm actually going to make it homework for y'all. You know that sheet I just gave you? Um, that has all of the equations of motion of a spring oscillator. Oh, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you, after we go over these equations tomorrow, to take that same sheet, except adapt it so that it's talking about a pendulum instead. Mm -hmm. So y'all will be coding something for me in Desmos. Uh, but actually, once you see the initial equation of motion, it's actually a pretty easy conversion to take everything we know about spring masses and change it all to pendulum. After that, uh, you should be good with most of the homework, and we'll have at least one day this week to just talk about um, uh, homework discussion time, you know? Uh, we'll have a workshop period that'll just be um, open season on any of the homework questions. Just call them out, and I'd be glad to work them out here uh, for your entertainment. <laughs> I don't know what the correct word there is. Uh, are there any questions on today's lecture? No. No? Okay. Uh, well, like I said, if you have some time and you're feeling antsy in your body the way that I do, mm -hmm. uh, install one or two of those apps, man. They're really good stuff. It's like good to stay physically fit uh, while we're all stuck at home. Uh, and I will see you tomorrow at the same place, same time. Please do subscribe on YouTube. Uh, and when a video is up, mash like. Um, if... Of course. If I get enough people to subscribe, I can get a custom URL. So instead of the URL being that nonsense, I can actually make it Mr. Robinson's classroom or whatever. Um, and if I get, happen to get enough views that I get like five cents of YouTube monetization, whatever <laughs> money I make on the YouTube channel will go towards a, the class party at the end of the year. Oh. Mr. Robinson? Yeah. Um, I have a quick question that's not about physics. Okay. Um, when do we find out about our FAFSA? Like, how do we know how much money we're getting from Cal Grant and how much we're getting offered for loans? Oh, it depends. So that information won't come through until you uh, accept a college. Oh. Oh, okay. Yeah, because, like, mm -hmm. your financial information that you submitted through FAFSA is what it is, but the amount of money that you'll be offered from each would be completely different if you went to UCLA for $38,000 a year or Cal State LA for $2,000 a year. So you don't get those financial statements until you um, start getting acceptances from colleges and then the financial statement for each college will be different based on your FAFSA. Oh. Okay. Mr. Robinson. Uh, yes. 
Is our homework still due tomorrow? Or are you going to postpone that? Oh, no. I'll uh, move it out. Let's make it Friday so that we have until the end of the week to Down do the lecture. Through. And then we'll at least have... Oh, no, that doesn't make sense either because we don't have class on Friday. If we had class on Friday, it'll be due Friday. Let's make it Monday so that you also have this weekend to wrap it up. Okay. Um, is that okay? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And like I said, that's all of the homework for Chapter 16. So for right now, you should be able to answer all of the questions on there about springs and pendulum. The only thing that we haven't talked about yet is what is the answer to the pendulum problem? We'll knock that out right at the top. And then we need to talk about what friction does in these systems, which is something called damping. It's why your car has such a smooth ride. Um, we'll do that. And then you'll be able to answer all of the questions to the end for sure over the weekend. Okay. So it'll be due 23rd at 10 p.m. It has just been updated. Uh, are there any other questions out there, AP physicists? No. No? Okay. Well, uh, you know, stay busy, stay active, uh, do an exercise, do the reading, do the homework, catch up on stuff that you left behind. And like I said, if you have any late work from quarter three, turn it in and it'll all be graded and entered um, so long as the grade book is open. Y'all have a nice day and I'll see you tomorrow. You too. Does anyone know about cardions having like um one of these? Zoom? I've no yeah, does anyone know if Mod Cardion's having a Zoom session? He had it with my sister's class, so probably. I have no okay. clue if she is. I don't Flora. think so. <laughs> she, she just told me. Oh. Cool. Peace, y'all. Okay, bye. Hey. I promise to not buy Battle.net. Um, okay, bye. Okay, bye. Okay, bye. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Email me your Battle.net. Yeah. I already, I posted it as a comment in classroom. Oh, word. I'll look at that.